This is a, a statewide day of mourning because it's the last Sunday before school starts. And uh, I was never, never a big fan of summer ending. Uh, I always, as a kid, I always longed for it to continue. But uh, there's, uh, there's still that cycle where summer ends and, and school starts back. And so this is the last sermon message in our summer series. And we've been talking all summer about what it means to be ready in season and out of season, to be able to live this disciple life going into the world and actually doing the stuff that needs to be done that's required for us to participate in the arena. You know, I can't help it, but when I heard, you know, when I, when I heard that, that, that passage of scripture it says be ready in season and out of season and we were thinking about this summer series i just i thought about sports you know the re, the need to be ready whether you're in the arena or not whether it's the season or not you got you got to be ready all the time and it takes it takes effort it takes time and we've talked about some things we've discovered some things We've reaffirmed some things, and we've looked at a lot of different things over the weeks, especially in First and Second Timothy. Then when we got into Titus, we kind of started wrapping it up, these last three messages, talking about what, it, what, it, what is necessary in our attitude in order for us to be uh, a good part of the team and for us to be uh, a worthy contributor. And also how we have to continually develop, that our development never ends. But, but today, as we wrap up this series, I wanted us to talk about one of the things that I feel, feel like is a key aspect to any team. And that is that a team is devoted to the mission. Now, we've talked about the mission a few weeks ago, Paul clearly states for the church that the mission is, is that everybody that we come in contact with knows the love of God, that they experience the, the truth about who God is and about who, what God is doing in this world. But, but I, I wanted to look at it and say, okay, so we're devoted to Christ and we're devoted to the mission, and we're, we're, we're devoted to the, to the team. You know, that, that's the reality. I, I tell people this all the time, that, that Christ is, is in relationship with the church, and Christ is seen as the groom, and the church is seen as the bride. In fact, there are many places in the Scripture where it says the church as the bride of Christ. And here's what, I, here's what I know, here's what I've learned over the years um, in, my rela in, in relationship to my relationship with the church and with Christ is that if you want to have a strong relationship with me, you better love Renee, okay? You better love my bride. If you don't love my bride, you don't love me because the scripture says that we are one, okay? Now... Listen, that doesn't mean you agree with everything that Renee does. I don't. And so, you know, it, it, because I know she's not perfect. Okay? But I love her unconditionally. And eventually she convinces me that she was right all along anyway. So, you know, we could, we could solve a lot of, lot of time. But it, my point is, I know the church has its problems. I know the church is, is struggles in some areas, but I know this, that the church is the bride of Christ. And if you're going to love the, the groom, you better love the bride. And so it becomes vitally important what our relationship is with the bride. And as, as the bride, what our relationship is like inside the workings of the body of the, of the bride. Okay, so here's what, I, here's what else I know. 
and this is, this is really important too, is everything in life is about relationships. Okay? If you don't think so, just think about this. Somebody approached Jesus one day and said, okay, what's life all about? And Jesus basically said, if you'll allow me to paraphrase and, and, to, and, and to put it in a concise form, Jesus said, it's about your relationship with God and your relationship with people. Love God, love people. The apostle John goes on even further and says, Listen, it's impossible for you to love God whom you cannot see if you don't love his people that you see every day. Okay? If you love God, you love people. If you love people, you, you love God. And, and those two come together. Okay? Now, here's the, here's the thing. What does it mean to love somebody? See, it doesn't mean letting them do whatever they want to do. I love my children, but at times I discipline them. You know? Sometimes I tell them no. Now, my grandchildren, completely different issue. Never tell them no. I just, you know, in fact, Harper, my three-year-old, has already discovered that I'm the weak link. And so uh, whenever she wants candy or anything... She asked chief, okay, which is, that's what she calls me. And, uh, and, and, and she says, uh, the other night I took her to, to get ice cream. And some of you may have seen this on Instagram or Facebook. She took me in there and she said, chief, I need ice cream. And we went in and she looked at it and she said, chief, I need pink ice cream because it's beautiful and delicious. And, uh, and so she got pink ice cream. Okay. Uh, so but when it came to my children, I did a better job. And I, was, I had a little bit more discipline. Because love is about putting the other person first. Philippians 2.3 says, See to it that you count others as more important than yourself. And he goes on to say, because that's exactly what Jesus did. Okay? He was equal with God. But he emptied himself. And put us first. So, here, here it is. We're, we're devoted to these relationships. Uh, but how do you know that what you're doing in these relationships is making a difference? How do, how do you, how, because I'm not perfect. I don't do right in every relationship. But it's my goal to continue to grow and develop and, and to be better in those relationships. So how, how do I make sure that I make it a difference? I, I want us to take a look real quickly at two verses of Scripture in the third chapter of Paul's letter to Titus. Chapter 3, verse 8 and verse 14. Okay? Now this is what he says. In verse 8, this is a trustworthy statement, and I want, to stress, I want you to stress these things so that those who have entrusted in God may be careful too. Okay, let me stop here for just a minute and say, in some translations it says this is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance. Okay, here, here's, here's the reality. What the Holy Spirit is saying through the Apostle Paul to Titus so that he can give it to the church and, and, and therefore to us, is this is the truth, and it really doesn't matter if, 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 how you feel about it. It's the truth, and there's, it, it's just the truth. And the best thing for you to do, the, the shorter journey, is for you to go ahead and embrace it, okay? Because it's not going to change. It's the truth, this is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance. So he says, so that you may be careful to devote yourselves to doing what is good. These things are excellent and profitable for everyone. And then he goes on down in verse 14. Our people must learn to devote themselves to doing what is good in order that they may provide for daily necessities and not live unproductive lives. So here's, 
Here's what the Holy Spirit says to the church. You need to be devoted to living a productive life. How do you know if your life is productive? How do you know you're making a difference? In fact, where we get the Greek word productive, it literally means useful and beneficial. How do you know if your life has been useful and beneficial? You know, I've, I've, I've sat with a lot of people over the years who are transitioning from this life to the next life. I, I've held a lot of hands of people who took their la, la, last breath on this side of eternity in my presence. And I've had a lot of conversations during those moments with people. And in many of those conversations, kind of center around this idea. I hope I've done something good. I hope I've made a difference. I hope I've been beneficial to somebody. I hope I've been useful. I hope I have done something that makes a difference in somebody's life. Well, here's, here's the news. I don't know if it's good news or bad news um, because it really depends on you. But the, the, new, the news is, is that you have um, made a mark in somebody's life. You, you have made a difference in somebody's life. Now, whether that mark or that difference is useful and beneficial kind of determine, is determined by three things, or at least three things, and this is what the Holy Spirit says. If you want to live a life of devotion that is productive, then here's what you need to do. You need to make sure that what you do is good. You need to make sure that you have the day-to-day -day stuff covered. And you need to make sure that what, you, what you're doing is positive and leads to growth. Okay? I want you to think about it. Make sure what you do is good. Not perfect, but good. Okay, because you can't do perfect. What, what good means sometimes is just that you back up and go, you know what, I messed up. I'm going to do better. Okay, but you do what is good. You make sure the day-to-day -day stuff is covered. And what you do is positive and leads to growth. Okay, so, so let's talk about it for just a minute. And let's talk about this devotion. Because here's what the word devoted means. This term, be devoted to, in the Greek, literally means that we carefully and considerately undertake resolutely and practice diligently and maintain the practice of. Okay, I know, now, I, I know that's kind of convoluted. So I want you to, I, I, I put it in terms that I could understand. I feel like if I understand it, anybody can. Okay, so what, it, what it's saying is to be devoted means that we are carefully and considerately undertaking the practice of being diligent in our day-to-day -day role of. See, in other words, I'm not just, I'm not just flying by the seat of my pants. I'm, I'm, a, I'm making a, a, a definite decision to consider what I'm contributing. To, make, to be careful about what I'm contributing and to be diligent in not only practicing it, but developing in my practice of it. Whatever it is, whatever my role is, because our roles are multifaceted. See, nobody in here has one job, okay? We have, we have one mission, but we don't all have one job. And, and see, I got to thinking about it, and I, and I thought, started thinking about these definitions, and, and here's, what I, here's what I figured out. Okay, so if I'm going to be productive in my relationship with Renee, then I need to be, I need to make sure that what I'm contributing is good, that I'm covering the day-to-day -day stuff, and that I'm contributing things that are positive and leads to growth in that relationship. But here's the kicker. 
See, it's not just about Renee and I. Because when, when, I'm, when I'm demonstrating that devotion in my life, I'm also showing my daughters what kind of husband that they ought to look for in this world. And, and Renee is just demonstrating to them what kind of wife they should be. And for my son, I'm showing him what kind of husband that, that he should be and that my wife is demonstrating what kind of wife he should look for. And guess what? Then that affects not only the, his generation or, her, or their generation, but also the next generation and the next generation after that. Have you, ever heard the, have you ever heard the scripture that says the sins of the father are visited on the children, the children's children, and the children's children's children unto the seventh generation? You ever heard that? I said, it's just in the scripture. But I'm going to tell you what, man. Our family, our, my, the family that I grew up in is living out some of the dysfunction of generations before us. Okay? Still to this day. In fact, my mom and my dad's side of the family were so stinking dysfunctional that I, I was convinced for years that if you looked up dysfunction in the dictionary, it would have family pictures of both sides of that family. But you know what? There's another scripture after that. It says that the, that the blessings of the father are visited on the children the children's children, and the children's children's children unto the thousandth generation. You know what? My mom and dad both said in their, in their 20s as they began their life together, the dysfunction stops here. And, the, and they began to diligently seek to do what was good to make sure the day-to-day -day stuff was covered and that what they were contributing was positive and lay, led to growth. And it has impacted not only my generation, but my children's generation. And now my children's children's generation. See, you, what, what, you, what you do in your role has an impact. farther than today or tomorrow or the day after that. See, but I'm not just talking about being a husband or a, or a spouse and a parent. But, but what about in our friendships? Am I doing what is good? Am I seeking to cover the day-to-day -day stuff? Am I being diligent in making sure that I'm contributing what's positive and leads to growth? Here's the thing about this in this passage of Scripture. If you look at it, if you're not careful, you'll miss it. But it says, teach them. You know what that means? It's not our natural state. We have to learn it. We have to learn it. It's something that we have to considerately, you know, and on purpose decide to do. Have you ever, have you ever run into somebody who was your friend and you were close to at one time, but you haven't talked in a long time. And so you, you run into each other, and they say to you, man, I, I, haven't, I haven't seen you in forever. You never call. You never call. What's your, what's your natural inclination at that moment? And I want you to be honest. Okay, and it's okay to respond. If somebody, just say, just say this afternoon at lunch, you go to wherever you're going to eat lunch and you walk in and there stands somebody you hadn't talked to in like a year and you say, hey man, how you doing? They said, great, you never call anymore. What's your first inclination? Aha, uh -huh, yeah, you never call me either. We go on defense mode. Phone works both ways. You know, I even get creative in it sometimes. I didn't know your fingers were broke. They said, they're not. They said, then you could have texted me, couldn't you? Uh, we go into defense mode. What if, we, what if we change that? What if we just said, you know what? You're right. I'm sorry. 
I should have called. I'm going to do a better job. You know what? You may be one of those people that have to set it in your calendar. On Thursday at 10 o'clock, you call your friend. Let me tell you something. Renee and I have learned this. If you, don't, if, if you suspect that maybe I'm exaggerating or I'm overstating it, you just ask her. She's sitting right over here. Raise your hand, Renee, so everybody can know where you are. Yeah, she's sitting right there. You ask her after this service. Has there ever been a time in our life where we felt like that God laid somebody on our heart that we, you know, that, I mean, you're just, you're driving down the road and all of a sudden you get this feeling, man, I should call Bob. We, re, what Renee and I have learned is call Bob. Now, not while you're driving because it's against the law now. Uh, have somebody that's riding with you call Bob, you know. But what I'm saying is don't, don't, man, if you have to, pull over. It, let me tell you something. If you feel like you ought, to, you ought to text your friend, text them. If you feel like you ought to call them, call them. If you think you ought to send a card, send a card. If you think you should go see them, go see them. Okay. Because the way that we do good, the way that we take care of the day-to-day stuff, and the way that we make sure that we're contributing positive and things that lead to growth makes a difference not only on this generation, but the generations to come. We leave a mark. It does make a difference. But see, it's not just about being a parent. It's not just about being a spouse. It's not just about being a friend. Let me tell you something. Your, as you, how you fill your roles in this ministry makes a difference. Do you know that we've actually counted, and there are over 500 volunteer opportunities in this congregation every week. Over 500. Now, every one of them don't get filled every week. But we've taken a look and said, in order for us to have the most impact, in order for us to do the most good, this is what needs to take place. And see, here's the thing. When you don't don't do your part, then something vital is missing. You know, my, uh, my youngest daughter does children's ministry here. And um, I just heard from somebody last week that uh, their uh, daughter used to fill out, you know, the thing that you do in school where you fill it out and says, what do you want to be when you grow up? Until this year... It had always been a pilot or an air traffic controller because that's, that's a lot of what her, her family did. But this year, when, when the teacher asked, what do you want to be when you grow up? She said, I want to be a children's minister like Miss Lexi. See, the way we fill our roles. Let me tell you something. The houses in Guatemala don't build themselves. Okay, but let me, let me tell you something else and then we've got to expand our thinking and understanding. The 64 people that went to Guatemala, they didn't build those by themselves. See, there are literally hundreds and hundreds of people that contributed to that in, in, in a lot of various ways, but it, made, it, it happened by people saying that I'm going to make sure that I considerately contribute what is good then I make sure the day-to-day stuff is covered and what I'm doing is positive and leads to growth because everything that we do is interconnected. We love God, we love people. We love people, we love God. When we do what we're called to do, whether it's in a home, as a spouse, as a parent, whether it's as a friend, whether it's in a ministry role, it makes a difference in people's life. It leaves a mark. It changes generations. Upon generations. You know, I, I'm, I'm so thankful for the opportunity to grow and to develop. And it's really important because none of us is where we need to be. I'm not. None of us are. We're all in the process. That's why we need each other. 
But you know what? It's really neat sometimes when you have like a hands-on thing where you can just, you can, you can touch it and visualize it and, and, and you know what you're talking about. A couple of weeks ago, where Nay and I were blessed by this congregation to take a trip to Paris, France in celebration of our 25 years of ministry here. It was a, it was a fantastic trip. I can't, we cannot thank you enough. But I want to tell you about something that, that just really impacted me and made a difference. We could, both of us have always wanted to go to the Louvre, and so it was like the first thing we did. We barely got off the plane. We were on our way to a tour at the Louvre, and we had a, we had a tour guide that took us and three other people on a two-hour tour of the Louvre. I, didn't, I, I never even knew this before, but we went in, and we went straight to the basement. And you walk in, and there are the, the, the foundation and the, and the first 20 or 30 layers of the, of the fortification that was built over 1,000 years ago. It's like actually like 1,500 years ago. The first castle of the monarchy of France. And, uh, I mean, that was so cool for like a history geek like me, you know, just to be able to reach up and, and, and touch those stones and know that they were put in place like 1,500 years ago. And uh, you're standing down in the moat. And the guide was talking and they uncovered it while they were doing some remodeling. They didn't even know it was there. They, they uncovered it a few years ago. And uh, she said, what do you notice about this? When you're looking at it, what do, you, what do you notice? And one of the ladies in our group said, well, it's amazing how intricate the stones are fitting together and how it stays together without mortar and, and stuff like that. And there were two or three answers. And she said, do you notice anything else? And we we're like, no. She said, did you notice that there were little marks on each stone? And, and then it dawned on me. There were. There were, there were little hearts. On, on some of the stones, and it'd be like hearts, like eight or nine hearts in a row. And then it would be a cross. And there were some crosses on this level and some crosses up on this level. And, and, then, and then there was a lightning bolt. And there were, there were a number of different little symbols. And she said, do you know what these are? And my first thought was graffiti. And she said, no, it's not, not graffiti. What it is is that each stonemason was paid according to the number of stones that they laid. And so each one of them had their own individual mark so that there could be a proper accounting and so that there could be some purity in the system and people not taking credit for work that somebody else had done. They each put their mark on the stone. And so at the end of the day, the foreman could go and he count the number of hearts and he knew what was due that mason and so forth and so on and, and then it hit me it hit me right there standing looking at those stones that 1500 years later their mark is still evident and you know what no one person did all the work. In fact, there were eight heart stones here and then two levels up, some more. And there were some crosses here and some lightning bolts here and they all fitted and joined together. But the work still stands. The impact is still there and the mark of their devotion to their calling and their task is still evident today and it hit me 
the mark that I leave will be here for generations. My devotion to doing what is good, making sure the day-to-day stuff is covered, and making sure that what I'm doing is positive and productive is not just about today or this week or this year or this generation. Because it's all fitted together. Each of us has our role. Each of us has our place. But when we take our devotion out of that, Something vital and something necessary is missing. Listen, you're not going to live a perfect life. You're not going to be a perfect spouse. You're not going to be a perfect parent. You're not going to be a perfect friend. You're not going to be a perfect team ministry member. But you know what you can be? You can be a devoted follower of Jesus Christ who says, when I go into the the battlefield when I go into the arena I'm going to make sure that I'm dedicated and I am considerately devoting myself to the practice of doing what is good making sure the day to day stuff is covered and that what I am contributing is positive and leads to growth and thankfully we have a leader who takes our meager best efforts and uses them and then fills in all the gaps. But he gives us the blessing of participation. And he allows us to pass on the blessings of his grace, his mercy, his forgiveness, and his love. Not just to the people that we come in contact with, but generation upon generation Father thank you for this day for this is the day that you have made and we rejoice and are glad in it and Father as we go from this place today help us to go as a devoted people and help us Father to always seek to do what is good to cover the day-to-day necessities of life and to be positive. Father, thank you for a son and a savior and a king who showed us the way. And Father, help us to follow him all the days of our life. For it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Well, we're glad you're here this morning, and uh, we hope you have a great week. I'm sorry for all of our students who are here today that this is the close of summer. I'm even more sorry for the teachers who have to go by. Uh, it is a national week of mourning, uh, especially in the state of Georgia. But uh, in spite of that, I hope you have a great week. And uh, we'll be here Wednesday night uh, with our cafe worship. We'll be starting a new series uh, out of the book of James entitled The Good Life. How many of y'all ever wanted to live the good life? Anybody? Anybody want to live the good life? Well, guess what? Over the next four weeks, we're going to tell you how to do it. Okay? It's simple and everybody can do it. So come join us. We start Wednesday night uh, with our cafe worship. And I hope you have a great week.